stick to the conference until uh, until later, but he's here now, and this is Dave Burgess, and Dave has agreed to uh, to do a Q and A with us uh, today, and we're just going to have a little conversation. Uh, we've all read the book uh, Teach Like a Pirate, and we have found it really, really um, inspirational and fun taking us back to our roots in a lot of ways. And so, uh, Dave, I wonder if you'd like to just introduce yourself a bit before we get started. And I would remind everyone to be sure that your microphone is muted and I'm going to turn off my camera so that I don't interfere with the bandwidth. Okay. So, hi, everyone. My name is Dave Burgess. I'm from San Diego, California. And so all the way as far down in California as you could possibly get. Next stop is Mexico if you keep going. And I'm the author of Teach Like a Pirate. I've been teaching at West Hills High School in San Diego for the last 17 years. I've been a U.S. history teacher there. And just this year, for the first time, I'm taking a one-year leave of absence. I've been doing all this uh, together at the same time. And this year, I'm taking a one-year leave of absence and going around and uh, touring and speaking and giving professional development workshops and talking to people about the book. But so it's been very strange to start the year uh, without a class in front of me for the first time in a long, long time. But I'm happy to be here with you guys. Can't wait to hopefully answer some of your questions. My question, and uh, my question is born out of my own, my own insecurity and my own fears. So here's my question. Um, do your colleagues ever disparage what you do or do they ever indicate that you're doing too much or making them look bad because you're just going all out? Okay. Well, I'm quite convinced that there are some of my colleagues who think that I am absolutely and completely insane. <laughs> and that that is absolutely and completely okay with me. And uh, a lot of times I'll have teachers come up to me at the end of workshops and say, you know, I'm the teacher at this school who other people think is crazy. And often I'll say, well, you know, that's a pretty decent sign that maybe you might be doing something right. Um, I Now I'm at the point where they kind of know who I am, and I don't run into that as much. But when I first started teaching, I did, I did run into that sometimes. And um, I always tell teachers that you kind of have to have a thick skin, and you have to have the kind of the personal power and the intestinal fortitude to know that, uh, if what you're doing is right for kids, you need to keep doing that even if it's not popular with some other people on your campus. And when your class becomes wildly popular, that's not going to make everybody happy. And that's a sad truth, uh, but it is a tr truth. And you have to kind of get to the, the point where you decide that, hey, that's, that's about them and some issues they're having as opposed to about being about you. And so you can't take that personally, and, and certainly you can't stop doing what you're doing if you think that it's right to fit. But did you ever find yourself sort of a, a community of one in your school? You know, sort of like, you know, you're, you're the one, you know, like there's nobody who really will collaborate with you or will, are you all alone in your room? How do you deal with that? Or did do they just overcome that with with time? And, and do they ultimately want to learn from you? You know, yeah, how does many, this work? Many of many of them have come on board, I, and I am fortunate that at my school I have kind of like a little inner circle of linchpins that are kind of my my people that I talk to and collaborate with, and we're all on the same page. We're, we're all very different. We all have very different styles, uh, but at the same time, we're we're pushing each other and not letting the outside world get to us in a sense and, and, and encouraging each other. So I do have that at my school. And in addition to that, what I have is I have an unbelievably positive, innovative, and creative pushing network on Twitter too. So I have a whole community of teachers on Twitter who I communicate with on a regular basis and we push each other, and when I need inspiration, when I'm feeling deep down or feel discouraged, I can always go there, and I know that there's people that are going to uh, be supportive of these ideas. Oh, that's great. So you can even go to the social network when, you're, when your actual physical network within your school isn't necessarily feeding you well. 
Yeah, and I think that's something that would be really important in some of the circumstances that some of you teach in, and that is that uh, within today's world, there are no geographical barriers to professional development and support networks and professional learning communities and all that kind of stuff because you can instantly get access to teachers all over the world now through social media. So where it used to be a situation where you might feel very isolated where you teach, that doesn't have to be the case anymore. You can find supportive people and people to collaborate with all over the world. Oh, that's great. Okay, I'm gonna go through these questions. I'm not gonna go through them in, in any given order. So I'm gonna ask uh, Ann, Ann Jones, would you like to ask the next question? Mm -hmm. Okay, am I unmuted now? I see you, Ann. Hi, okay, hi Dave, I'm Ann Jones, and I teach an elementary education program here at UAS. Um, but for many years, I was a teacher in California as well. And many of my students and their parents came from Mexico and Central America and Armenia and Russia. And I'm wondering um, how much, if you, the kind of reaction you got from immigrant parents who were much more used to a traditional, formal, kind of education, and, and if you took any pushback and how you explained to them what you were doing in your classroom. Yeah, so I, I have not had a, a lot of pushback at all on these, on these tactics and strategies and all that. And I think what happens is uh, almost immediately their kids are coming home excited about school, talking about class, talking about what happened, and that is a a huge change of pace for what they're used to. And so that's a that's something that's helped me a lot is I know that I, I'm gonna be able to get buy-in because as soon as I got that kid, then he's gonna go home and be talking about and buzzing about class. And I do, when when we have an open house early in the year, I, I come as the character, this probably doesn't surprise you, and um, I explain, I act as if Mr. Burgess is not there and I'm in, in full character the whole time, and I give an explanation sort of of Mr. Burgess and what his strategies are and techniques and tactics, and it's like this high energy sales pitch sort of about what how this class is gonna be different and why it's different, and uh, I, I think I've done a pretty good job of selling it because I, I do not have pushback on these ideas. You don't you don't get any confusion from them with the language barriers that they don't understand maybe that you really are Mr. Burgess. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, no, I don't I don't think so. <laughs> I, I've had I've had great success with um, with immigrant families. Fact, I teach all of the ELL students at West Hills who are juniors. They, they typically will come through my class, and. Uh, one of the things about these strategies is that it's perfect for that population because there's so much, so much uh, like mm -hmm. texture and so much richness to the lessons and like the emphasis on props and visuals and pictures and music and all that. These are all contextual clues that make uh, learning easier for students, especially who are just acquiring the language. So typically they're gonna have far more success in that kind of environment than they would in a typical, uh, maybe a more like lecture-based and formal setting. Well, I'm glad the parents have been supportive of you because I can see that this would be a little bit strange for someone who comes from a more traditional school background. Right. right. All right, I wonder, uh, Hallie, if you'd like to ask your question. This is a, a question uh, from from uh, from Hallie Bennett. Hallie, are you there? <clears throat> Hallie. Yes. Yes. Would you like to ask your question? Yes, um, in the Bering Strait where I currently teach and Courtney teaches that well, we have to do a lot of like scripted programs where we have enough time just to fit the program in. How do we, how could we include these different hooks into the scripted programs that a lot of us are currently using? Okay, now so I think it was 
maybe was it Courtney who used the term stealth creativity in one of her blog posts? Does that sound right? Courtney, I think she's in. I think she's in another meeting, and she's double doing double duty. Oh, this is Karen. Talk? I I used that. It was Karen. Yeah, I was going to say that? that was not. Yeah, yeah, that was Karen. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Well, so I, I like that term. And here's what I always. Well, first of all, um, I am not a supporter of scripted programs and scripted learning, as you can probably guess from the book. I think I even pointed it out directly in the book. I am 100% uh, against the cloning of teachers or any sort of a program that makes that uh, indicates that teachers should teach everything in exactly the same way. Because I think that what is unique about you, your particular strengths and talents, and that unique voice that you add to your class is what makes you most powerful and effective in front of kids. And so I would uh, – I would be looking to uh, sneak in as much creativity as I possibly can. And one of the ways you can look at this is a section of the book where I talk about the three circles, the triple Venn diagram. And even though you might have the same uh, content circle and you might have some of the same strategies and techniques as your second circle, that third circle, which I label as presentation, that is your chance to be you. And that is your chance to add that creativity and to add that unique personal voice into what you do. So even though you might feel somewhat confined by the other two circles, I think you should always be looking to add your own unique hooks and your own unique presentation to what you do. That's going to make you more uh, powerful. It's also going to help personalize you for your students because they're going to see you as more of a human being and someone that, uh, you know, I don't know if this might not resonate with you you know, where you teach because it might be in such small communities, but uh, I'm used to it. it. A lot of times teachers, if they see a student outside of class, students are almost shocked to see you. Like it's, oh, like if I'm at the movies or something, like, oh, Mr. Burgess, what are you doing here? And I say, oh, um, actually, Stephen, I'm a human being. I exist outside of the four walls of my classroom. I don't sleep in the cupboards or anything. And, uh, when you start to add your presentation, your passions, and all that into your classroom, then that helps to personalize you and helps you to create rapport, too. That's one of the things that people have noted about the book is that it's more conversational in tone than some educational textbook kind of stuff. And I think my class is more conversational in tone, too, because I'm trying to add me into what I do. Have a follow up or okay, very good. All right, Virgil, I wonder if you'd like to ask your question. Where's Virgil? Oh, I'm here. You want to see my face? Uh, let's see where a uh, camera. There you go. I don't know if you can see me now or not. Wait, are, are are you are you trying to tell me that they let another man in on this? I thought this was yeah. like a, a female only thing here. No, no, no. I I teach the math education courses, so uh, my class is is it came in here as well. Um. Anyway, I'm just kind of kicked back and listening. I think it's kind of fun. My question what had to do with um how do you help? How do you using your techniques? How do you get the students to get to take ownership of their own learning. How do you bring that in there, you know? Right. Um, I don't know. I, I didn't word it exactly like that, but it's on the spreadsheet somewhere. <laughs> um, but I was just wondering because cause I, I'm excited. I think, you know, having having been in the classroom as well and having done this and have students think you're kind of on the nutty side anyway, and I'm being an abstract, random person. I'm always jumping around from one thing to the other. The hardest thing for me in teaching distance courses is not being able to move around when I'm teaching. So I'm sitting yeah. here, you know. And right. But how do you get high school students and middle school students to take ownership of their learning, at, you know, and not just view this as entertaining? Right. Okay. So uh, part, of, part of this stuff.
I think, is showing them the, the relevance of what you're doing and showing some sort of real-world connections to what they're learning. And in addition to that, um, I think that one of the great secrets of, in, of student engagement is rather than spending so much time trying to get students engaged by what we're talking about, we need to spend more time taking what we're talking about and tying it into what they are already engaged in. So I'm trying to find out as much information as I can about my students. I want to know what what, uh, what music they listen to, what shows they watch, what movie are they excited about that's coming out on Friday. I want to know what their hobbies are. I want to know all of this stuff. I want to know what the big app is that they're all using on the phone. Like this past year, uh, things like Vine videos and you know Instagram and Twitter and um, Snapchat, all these things will be coming big at my school with the kids. I want to know that because these are ways that I, these are, this is ammunition that I can use to work with kids. I also want to know that student who maybe doesn't feel a connection to school right now, but they love art, or maybe they have musical talent that the, the school system is generally not tapping into. And I'm starting to provide more alternative projects and more alternative assessments for my students in the hopes that that's going to uh, wake some of these students up and, ha and help them to flourish. So I've noticed that uh, like one of the things I'm telling teachers a lot right now is we need to be more concerned with the learning that's taking place and less concerned with how they show it. So that student who is a musical genius but doesn't get a chance to express that in school if you provide the chance for an alternative project or somehow them, that they could tie this into their musical abilities, then that's something that's going to, um, they're going to start to open up. They're not, and then not only is, there, is it going to help them open up for this assignment, but it might help them just identify with school and education and your course uh, in general. So since I spend so much time talking about teachers exploring their passions and fulfilling their passions in teaching, it's just as important that we allow students to explore their passions and to have a little autonomy in, in how they explore the content that we're, that we're covering. By the way, I can tell you uh, my biggest challenge with um, the distance learning and with this setting is since I can't see any of you, I have no way of judging <laughs> The, the, these, these answers, I mean, man, I would love to see you, see if you're nodding your head or seeing if you uh, have a, a, a face of scorn when I'm answering this. <laughs> and I think the getting them interested in one, if you can tie them into one course or one thing, I think yeah. that they, they understand a little bit better how uh, the other courses can be brought in as well. Yeah. And yes, I was nodding. Just so you know. Okay. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very strange setting to talk, and then I just hear complete silence, and then I hear the next question, and I think, oh, oh I wonder how that went. <laughs> They're also uh, engaging on the back channel, and okay. uh, so there's there's some conversation going on here, and people are are sharing things that are related to what you're talking about. So. I think that uh, that you're getting some good reception. We're getting some nonverbals that are very good here. Okay. <laughs> okay, Andrea, would you like to ask your question? Sure thing. Am I on? Hi, Andrea. Hi, Dave. I'm Andrea. I teach um, I teach free algebra at the college level online up here in Homer, Alaska. And so I'm still thinking about taking that first step into using these hooks. And I would love to hear what your first experience was the first time you decided I'm gonna I'm just gonna jazz this up and and present it to my students in a different way. Did you have kids on board right away, or were they rolling their eyes at you, or? Um, <laughs> Were they paying attention? I'm just curious how it went. Uh, well, I, I think that I've always been a little bit of a, a pirate teacher. So I was doing this early on. I was doing this as a student teacher before I got my own classroom. And um, I don't have any real, real embarrassing stories or anything about how this all started. 
what I noticed right away was, uh, you know, sometimes people will ask me, well, aren't you nervous that your, your hooks, using hooks won't work? Like it, it won't play. And I, I kind of always ask them, well, what, what is the alternative? Not having a hook? Well, for sure that's not going to work. So I don't get concerned about hooks not working. I don't get concerned, uh, that something might not particularly hit, might not particularly hit with any one particular kid or group of kids on a certain day. Because I'm going to come back at them again, and I'm going to try another way and another tactic and another tactic after that. And uh, that's why you have to have a huge toolbox of these things. If you're always going to the same tool, then there might be a segment of your audience that you're missing out on. So that's why I'm, I encourage people to have a huge toolbox and to try to layer hooks into their class. And uh, you can't be that teacher who does something right at the beginning of class that's kind of funny or fun and engaging and then nothing, and then 45 minutes later be disappointed that people aren't uh, engaged with your lesson. And you're like, well, don't you remember that funny thing I said 45 minutes ago? No, it, these, these things have to be constantly layered. Like I like to look at it like that when you look at the steak analogy that I use in the book. You have to turn the steak over and baste the other side partway through. Then you have to take it off. Then you provide the side dish and the beverage and the dessert afterwards. And all of these things are layered together to create and a dining experience that makes people want to come back and dine with you again or come back and learn with you again. So um, right from the beginning, uh, I, w I was using hooks, and I was not as good at it, but it was still better than nothing because the alternative is not acceptable, and that is to stand up without a hook and try to engage somebody. So I, I noticed that on the back channel, someone said, uh, well, even if it flops, it works because the kids notice every mistake, and, and there's some truth to that. And some of my best, some of the best lessons have come after the lesson that was supposed to happen completely failed, and then I had to adjust on the fly and try something that was just impromptu, and then sometimes that's the lesson that I've kept, not the, not the planned lesson, but the lesson that was the impromptu lesson. Good. Karen, I wonder if you'd like to, just uh, on that note, if you'd like to ask your question. question was a little, kind of a spin off of Lee's. Um, a lot of our feedback um, in our conversation every week has been people kind of being afraid of their administrators and their administrator's reaction. So you responded that your coworkers had a negative reaction, but you're winning them over. What kind of resistance have you got from your administrators? And if you did, how did you have the nerve to do what you wanted to do anyway? Okay, so this this is going to be an answer which um, you might not like. I don't care who doesn't like the strategy. If I think I'm doing what's right for kids, I'm going to do it. And I have an attitude that's a little bit, um, it's a little bit confrontational on this. And that is that if, uh, if I'm not going to be allowed to do in my classroom what I know is right for kids, then I'm not going to be there. And so they can't do anything to me that's not, if I'm not going to be allowed to teach the way that I know is right for kids, I don't want to be there anyway. So I don't have any fear about administrators or anything like that. I'm going to be okay. But at the same time, I think one of the things that you have to do is you have to – we have to be better at marketing and we have to be better at selling why it is – why what we're doing is working and, and how it's working. Sometimes people allow uh, – so like administrators will come in sometimes and just get a little snapshot of what you do. And maybe it didn't go particularly well at that moment. Well, one of the ways you can counter that is by inviting them into your room more often, especially when you have some lessons which you know are these special lessons that are going to really hit and they're going to see powerful learning taking place. So it's very hard for someone who is uh, 
who is educationally sound as an administrator to walk into a room and see in, engaged kids, kids on fire about learning, great conversations going on, great learning taking place clearly, and then to be upset about that because the techniques used were a little bit off the wall. Um, so I, I don't want them just to hear the stories, the buzz. I, I invite them in to see what this is act, actually looks like. And then they have a greater body of knowledge to evaluate and judge me on. So when you just let an administrator come in five minutes here and 10 minutes here at random, then you're maybe at the mercy of, of something not going well. So the more that they can get in the room and see you doing wonderful things, the better you are and the more able you, that, that helps you temper some of those moments where they see the, the lesson that does flop. Any administrator that doesn't understand that good teaching sometimes involves failure too is, uh, has got a real problem. I know a lot of administrators talk about uh, supporting risk taking and all that, but then what they really mean is as long as it works out. The fact of the matter is you have to support your risk takers even when it doesn't work out or it, it's, or that's not, that's not acceptable. I really want to know what you guys are thinking as I said well, that answer. Yeah, the back channel is buzzing. And so, um, yeah, Jen wants to know, um, this, this feeling that you have that, um, you know, you don't want to be in the classroom if you can't do what is right for students, is this a conviction that you have or is it your teaching preference? She wants to know, are you deeply convicted or, or is this just really your teaching preference and this is the way you prefer to teach? This, no, this is not a teaching preference. This is, this is a conviction in that I'm, I look at education as a life transformational product. I, I did not get into education for the, the content per se. I got into education for those category two professional passion reasons from the, the passion chapter of Teach Like a Pirate. I'm there, hopefully, to change kids' lives and to have an influence on them. And the when I can't, if, if I'm put in a position where I can't do that and I can't be the best that I think that I can be in the classroom, then that's that's not a place that, that I'm willing to be. Life is too long, and we spend too many hours at work to be fearful of uh, doing what we – I can't imagine doing a job where I knew I could do it a lot better a different way, but I let somebody else intimidate me into not doing it that way. And so I, that is definitely a conviction, not just a preference for me. Very good. Very good. And I agree. I think a lot of us, a lot of us feel that way, and then, but then we get pulled down by the fear. And I don't know if if it's um, if it's real that we can't do what we want to do in our classrooms, or if we just feel this way because of the test scores and the and the blah and the blah. And so we feel like we can't do this, but maybe maybe it's really just our own fear that's sort of holding us back. I think that's absolutely true. I again. It, it's hard for me to imagine an administrator who would have a teacher who the kids are just on fire about learning and knocking down the walls to get into that class and uh, and totally engaged with what's going on because of the tactics and techniques that are being used, and then for that administrator to not want to see that in their school. So I'm sure that there are uh, I'm sure there are maybe some out there, but if there are, they're they're bad ones. And I'm I'm not in the business of trying to please um, bad administrators. <laughs> Excellent. Ann Curland, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, I guess this um, comes back to you mentioned not wanting to have to teach in a scripted environment, but when we administer standardized tests, we're really required, I guess by law in some cases, certainly by district policy, to adhere 
to word for word the whole protocol for the testing environment. And I'm just wondering if you have any advice for things that we can do to prepare students for those standardized testing days, and how can how can we reduce their test anxiety and tap into their own creativity to be successful on those tests? Uh, well, now, if you're talking about um, a scripted environment, like on the day that you're giving the standardized test and it wants you to read the directions to the kids and have the all, you know, fill in this bubble and all, all of that, that, that's that's a little bit of a different situation that I'm talking about. I'm talking more about uh, instructions. So if you have to read something from a script on the day that you give the standardized test, that's um, – that, that that's not really that's not really the battle that I'm I'm fighting. I'm fighting the battle when someone is scripting out my my instruction and maybe the person who has scripted my instruction is not as qualified to deliver that instruction as I am and so I I'm not following that script. But if uh if you're if you're just talking about a standardized testing situation then I, I don't have a problem with you like reading the directions or instructions or anything like that, if that's what you're talking about. Oh. Um, you have to do that, of course. Yeah. But yeah. how do you prepare your students? Do you have any tips for um, preparing the students leading up to that day to help reduce their test anxiety or to give them strategies that they can use while they're in that environment to tap into their creativity? Because it is such a transition from you know, your normal, more dynamic classroom environment, suddenly they're in this rigid, sterile testing environment. Just do you have any tips for preparing them for that? Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's just something that you discuss, that you discuss with them. I know that I, as we're heading into our testing period, because we, we have to get standardized tests at my school as well, um, I kind of talk to them about how to play the game. And that this is, you know, this is something that we have to do. This is the, what the, the law requires that you're going to take this test. And we're going to try to, you know, we're going to try to do the best that we can. But I, I don't, I, I de-emphasize the test. And it's not that I don't want my students to do well on the test. And it's not that my students don't do well on the test. I just want to de-emphasize that. And I think that if we take care of business, on all of the other days that the test is going to take care of itself. But I, I am not into the whole spending great deals of, a great deal a great deal of time on test prep and practice testing and all of these things that are costing me instructional time. I'd rather have that instructional time and I think that's going to do do the kids better on the test in the long run anyway. So um I, I said this line in the book, and it, w it wasn't meant to be confrontational, or maybe it is, but uh, I said, at, at some point in your career, you have to decide whether you teach the test or whether you teach the kids. And I decided a long time ago, I teach kids. And um, I know in today's culture and environment, sometimes in education, that that's a tough sell for people, but that's what I'm selling. The idea of framing it as how to play the game. I think that's, I don't know why I didn't think of that myself, but I think that's exactly what I was looking for. It yeah. Puts it in context for them and keeps right. it in perspective. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you think about, you know, when we were kids, when I was a kid, we still had standardized testing, but we, we didn't have all this test prep and we didn't have all of that, but we did know when the test came, it was time to sit still and mark the bubbles and, and do those things. Right. And so we did it um, because that's it what was expected. well, too, though, Lee. I'm sorry? And you used to sl you used slate with a piece of chalk. No, you used an inkwell. You had to dip your pen in and put the Yeah, in. yeah. Now, that was you, <laughs> Virgil. <laughs> <laughs> At least we were writing on paper and not caves. And so... <laughs> Part, part part of this too is a sales pitch that is a year long sales pitch that uh, whatever it is that we're doing in class, it's or whatever you're doing in life, is there's something to be said for doing it as well as you can, and for um, that if you're going to do it, it's worth doing well, 
And so we might not like that we're taking tests this week in class, but since that's what we're doing, we're going to do it well. And that's kind of a perspective that I want them to have about about everything in life too. So this this is just one piece and part of a, of a larger picture over the course of the year that, hey, you know what, sometimes we have to jump through some hoops that we don't want to jump through. As teachers, we have to jump through some hoops that we don't want to jump through. But you know what? I'm going to jump through that hoop as best as I can, and then I'm going to get to the other side and move on. So that's kind of part of this whole perspective, too. Absolutely, and a very good point, very good point. Marco, I wonder if you'd like to ask your question. Margo, we're having trouble hearing you, I think. Are you typing? Oh, no mic. Okay, so uh, Margo's question is, uh, what do you do when a student does not respond to how you teach? They will not engage even in your engaging classroom. Okay. So um, I'm going to tackle this from uh, a couple different perspectives. The first perspective is that's feedback that I need to to know that I, whatever I'm doing is not reaching this kid, and I need to do some more. I need to seek some more information, some build some better rapport, uh, a relationship here, and find out what's going on with this kid. So part of it is on me, and. Uh, I just haven't found a way to to get this kid into what I'm talking about. And so that's the feedback that I need to get better. And if maybe this kid is not into what I'm doing, it, he might be a, just a visible sign of a larger problem that might be going on in the class. So that's one side of this. The other side of it is this. We sometimes beat ourselves up because we have unrealistic standards for what constitutes success. And this is in the little sidebar kind of uh, post in the book about um, life is not 100% or fail. And that I know some teachers who beat themselves up to an unbelievable extent when they don't have 100% engagement in the classroom. Well, anyone who's been in the classroom for a long time knows, or just a short time, if you're not going to feel happy and feel successful unless you have 100% engagement 100% of the time, you are not going to be happy in this profession. So if, if anyone thinks that they were going to walk into my class and not see a kid uh, slipping a text in his lap, looking out the window, maybe trying to sneak his math homework out to do it at some point in a, in a class or in a period, then they're mistaken because those things happen in my class too. And uh, what we want to do is we want to have the best engagement that we possibly can. Do these tactics, strategies, and techniques of Teach Like a Pirate lead to 100% all the time? No. What they lead to is more engagement than we would have had if we didn't use these techniques and strategies. So uh, you cannot beat yourself up uh, about lack of 100% because perfection just is not going to happen. But sometimes we, we set ourselves up for failure by setting that as a standard. Good. Very good. And it's such a good point. Okay, Krista's question. Krista, would you like to ask me a question? Krista has a microphone that's working, so I'll ask Krista's question for her. I don't. I really don't believe these people are there. I think he's making this up. <laughs> Krista, are you there? He doesn't believe you're there at all. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, I can okay. hear Krista I'm now. Looking on my phone, but I guess it wasn't happening. Anyway, <laughs> I was just wondering. Um, how, as a more reserved person, I might be able to apply some of your ideas and practices in the classroom 
because uh, some of the stuff is wonderful, but I would feel really uncomfortable <laughs> trying to do some of the things you do. So you, are you trying to tell me that you don't want to crash like a plane on the floor, swim across the carpet, and then get into a light raft? A little, a little bit like that. <laughs> okay. Uh, the, your question is fantastic, and it's one that I hear all the time. So the Teach Like a Pirate system is not something that you have to be uh, an extrovert to do. Or it's not something that uh, you have to find your comfort level. And Well, first of all, of course, I will want you to expand and try to step out, out of your comfort zone a little bit. But uh, this is for introverts, too. And um, I think it's Susan Cain who recently wrote a book that might be, it might be called Quiet, and it's about introverts and the power of introverts in the world. And uh, it's a book that you might want to check out because she argues that there's absolutely a place for introverts and even professions that we consider to be um, extrovert in, uh, in nature. So the Teach Like a Pirate system, maybe it's not you on stage doing all these crazy performance things. Maybe you're using technology to engage. Maybe you're, get, maybe you're orchestrating the crazy and wild things that the kids are doing. So you're putting their, them more on stage. And some of these things might actually even be better than you being on stage anyway. Um, in addition to that, I think you can have an unbelievably powerful presence in front of kids without being wild and crazy. I know very conservative teachers who still have that charisma or presence when they step in front of a class. And um, I tend towards the somersault and cartwheel style of teacher. But I just just recently, in last March, I went to the ASCB conference in Chicago, and I saw Maya Angelou give the keynote address. And Maya Angelou was brought on stage in a wheelchair. She was, like, lifted up to the platform level and wheeled out in a wheelchair and then positioned in front of a microphone. She didn't move the entire time except for to reach over and grab a book beside her on the table at one point. And she completely mesmerized thousands of people for about 45 minutes as she weaves stories back and forth through. And so it's, it, it's really not about the crazy antics unless that's your, that's your style. That happens to be my style. But even within your style, you can find ways to teach like a pirate and to engage kids. Follow up, Krista, or? It is, isn't it, Ann? I mean, that's a nice way of thinking about it. You know, we just find our passion and our place in the classroom, and we can make that work. So, Just recently, a teacher who read my day two activity, which is very wild, and it's the one where I'm, like, flying around the room like a plane and crashing and doing all these things. Uh, they really liked the collaborative group part of that, which is the heart of the lesson, but they didn't feel comfortable doing the performance piece, which is my beginning. So what they did is they're excellent in iMovie and in and technology, and so they created a plane crash scenario, with a rescue helicopter, all these things, using technology and played that at the beginning of the class and the kids ate it up. And then the lesson went went on just as, you know, just as successful as my lesson is, but they used their particular skill and what they felt comfortable with to do the same thing that I was doing in my class. That's so cool. And Heather's saying, I love that too. I love that activity. I'd love to be there to see it. We want to see it on YouTube. <laughs> That's what we want. Okay, Ava, would you like to ask your question? Sure, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you, Ava. All right, my first question was, um, are you familiar with learning styles? Yes, like kinesthetic, auditory, visual, stuff like that. 
Yeah, I was just wondering what were some of your um, kinesthetic activities in the classroom? Okay, yeah, so I like to try to incorporate as many of these uh, learning styles into my lessons as I possibly can. I want there to be the, the visual props. I want there to be the, I'm always trying to get teachers to get rid of the 547 bullet points on their PowerPoint and use more images. Um, and I like to get kids out of their seat and moving. One of the ways I do this is I think that we tend to be, uh, we're so confined to our, inside of our four walls. And so I ask teachers to ask themselves, where would be the best place on campus to deliver this lesson? And sometimes the answer might be not inside of your, spa your, your room space. And so it just kind of gets you thinking a, a different way. Um, I like to uh, have simulations in the classroom. I like to, uh, I think in this, you might have read in the book the story of the Henry Box Brown, where the kids get inside of Henry's box. He was nailed oh, yes. to freedom inside of a wood box, and they get inside the box and do things like that. Yeah, so I'm always looking for ways to have a visual component to what's going on, an auditory component, um, lots of music and things like that, but then also getting kids up and moving too. Yeah, so I think it's I think it's great for everybody when you incorporate all of these different learning styles in. And when people say, "Well, I'm just this kind of learner," I I don't buy that at all. I think that we're all a combination of these things, and so we all learn better when there's a combination of these things in our lessons. Great. Okay, my last question is: um, We're having an education summit coming up in November 11th and 12th for the Interior Region of Alaska. Uh -huh. And I was wondering if it would be okay to share some of the quotes from your book during the summit. Oh, absolutely. Is it, uh, yeah, you feel free to, I I want the message to spread. I want this to, to get to as many people as possible. So feel free to share as much as you want. Is there going to be a technological, like, like is there going to be a social media aspect to this? Like is there going to be a hashtag on Twitter or anything like that? We usually um, have our tech guy, IT department, set up a, um, where people can watch it on the internet. Okay. So we, last year I think we had someone from Scotland <laughs> listening in. So. Yeah. And, so, and if, you, uh, if you do like come up with a hashtag for the event and have uh -huh. people tweet it about it like during the event, uh, you could contact me and uh, remind me when this is going to be and I would be happy to jump in on Twitter and throw some tweets in there, some quotes, and say hi to people and stuff like that. And in addition to that, how, how many people will be there? We usually have about 250 to 300 people. Okay, so let's do this. So let's do some sort of a giveaway, um, some sort of prize or something at the event. And like we could give away uh, a signed book or two and maybe a Teach Like a Pirate t-shirt. Let me see if you can see this. Teach Like a Pirate t-shirt right there. And uh -huh. um, so if you want to have like some raffles or giveaways and things like that, then I'd be happy to provide those for your event. Great. Sounds wonderful. Thank you. Uh -huh. I want to enter, um, Ava. So let me know. Okay. I'll keep you all updated. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Okay. Let's see, would you like to pull up your question then? I agree, Jen. I think we should drop our t-shirt right now. How, how do you want to do that? I'm ready to give away a t-shirt right now. How do you want to do it? Oh my gosh. Okay, well Virgil, Virgil, how would we do that? You're the numbers person. <laughs> well, I tell you, I tell he, you, you have to have a good arm, Tracy. Um, I'll tell you what we'll do, we'll just... Uh, uh, how many people do you have here? We'll just randomly pick a number and, you know, from one to whatever. Are they all are they all listed down a scroll like on a on a side thing? Yeah, we have them. Well, I have a list of people I can run down and just see who's there. And it looks like we have. Let's see, five, ten. Is it yeah, 15, yes, 20. We have 30. It took me that long to actually count them. While y'all were talking, I can't count okay. while people talk. All right, so I'll, I'll go ahead and get a random you're gonna number. Roll the, you. You're going to roll the dice? 
Yeah, there's I'll tell programs you that, that you can use to generate a random number too, like a little, like yeah. a little online program. All right, I'll do it. It'll be a minute, and you'll have it. Okay. Do do two numbers, and they can choose whether they want to get a a, a fine book or if they want to get a T-shirt. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> And that's the end of the last game that I just played. Yeah. Should we, should we let uh, Lexi ask her question while uh, Virgil's working out the randomness? I, I noticed, by the way, that Lexi had thought that a really great way to determine who the winner would be was just like, who has the next question? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which would have been very logical, right, Lexi? <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes, I can. All right, so my question was, I know it's important to teach to the kids and what reaches them most and to motivate them, but that can be pretty time consuming to plan and get everything together. So do you have a stopping point when you say you can't spend any more time for preparing for classes? Do I have a stopping point, like some sort of thing at home where like, I shut everything down and is that what you mean? Myself recently when I'm getting stuff ready for class, I spend hours at home in addition to work and I'm not a slacker at work. I actually work. I don't hang out in the teacher's lounge and gossip and stuff. So I just know it can be very time consuming. So how do you manage being a good teacher and doing that stuff but then also having a life outside of the classroom? Right. Um, well, okay. So uh, I should probably pull my wife into the room for this question because maybe she'll tell you that I don't do a good job of that. <laughs> Um, so anyway, one, I think one of the secrets is, and I, I, I don't want to misquote this person, I think it was John Maxwell, who I was listening to an audio tape of his, and he talked about working unseen hours. And I th I'm good at working unseen hours, and that means that I, I'm going to work that, uh, like if I, if, I take a plane, if I take a plane flight somewhere, then that's where I'm going to try to get some of my writing done then, some of my thinking done then, some of my reading done. Um, uh, that, that time that I'm awake before the rest of my family is awake, that time that there's that little 30-minute gap in here. And one of the secrets of this is you have to make getting to work easy. And what I mean by that is some people, if I were, gonna, if I were to say, hey, you know what, let's, let's, let's work on one of your lesson plans right now. Well, it might be 30 minutes before they were ready to work on that lesson plan because they had to get their stuff out or if it's all at school. I have systems that have things readily available for me to work on so that when I do have that little bit of downtime, I'm able to work on stuff. I'm able to do a lot of my social media um, in the unseen times. Like I'm doing that when I'm standing in line. I'm checking my Twitter feed and I'm doing these things. You know, so it's, uh, that's part of the secret. And then the other part of the secret is none of this happens all at once. And so there is a time where you have to stop. And uh, the, way, the way that I've got my class to where it is has been a long process of many, many, many years. And I did not step in on my first year of teaching and have all of this put together. And so it's something that you build over time. And you do have to – you can't be at your best for your students if you don't give yourself time to unwind and to explore outside passions and to have your family life and exercise and health and all that. So I, I don't like to see teachers that uh, are so 100% involved in what they're doing that they um, they neglect their family, neglect their health. And in the long run, that's just going to hurt the, the, hurt your students as well. And, you know, we talked about, you know, when we started this class, it's online, it's in the open, the, the, um, the feeling that you have to be on all the time, on all the time. Sometimes we just have to unplug and be depressed. Yep. And we just have to spend time with our family or watch Titanic or a silly movie or just something, you know, just to decompress. So, yep. Absolutely. So, so it is important to take time for ourselves. Does no one – yes, Grey's Anatomy starts tomorrow. Doctor Who works as well. Absolutely. Get me my TARDIS. Yes.
Sorry to interrupt. Can I make a comment on that? Because I have always felt like I have to go, go, go and be on, on, on. And the one thing that occurred to me today is, <laughs> not today, this year, sorry, is that it's okay to slow down. Yes. As even in your classroom, um, give them five minutes with a book so you can get yourself together instead of rushing into the next activity. And that has just helped me so much as far as always being on because then I can reset and get ready to be on for that next lesson if I'm completely ready. Oh, that's wonderful, Courtney. Yep. And it is. And, you know, I did that too. I, I taught using Nancy Atwell's writing workshop, and Monday through Thursday the class was chaos because we'd have reading workshop, writing workshop. But then Friday it was silent reading, and it was let's all bring in our sodas and our food and our gum and whatever you want, but we're just going to read. Whatever we want to, wherever we want to, but we read. And it was just sort of that day that we all kind of decompressed, and I needed that day after all of that chaos all week. And so um, I think it's important to yeah. uh, build in some downtime for students and for yourself. Yeah. So it's a good thing. All right, very good. Well, I think Tracy left. Tracy had to go to another meeting. So, yes, she's gone. So. Okay, Barbara, would you like to ask your question? Um, hey, Barb. Um, it, we kind of hit the administrator question a little bit earlier, but I think my question is a little bit more broad, not just people's individual administrators, but in the case for Dave, when you address administrators in different talks, or I'm just curious to know if you have enthusiastic administrators out there who want to adopt some of these strategies, these strategies as part of the vision of the, you know, for a school. Oh, yeah. If we have some. Yeah, so I, the, I, I lost it. I lost the end of that question, but the, um, if the question was, are there some administrators buying into this as sort of like a school-wide vision? Absolutely, not just school-wide, but in many cases, district-wide. Like the, the Teach Like a Pirate is a theme at many schools right now for this, for this school year and for many districts across the, uh, across the nation that they have, where a superintendent has bought books for the entire staff or for principals have bought books for their entire staff and then oftentimes brought me in to do a workshop to kind of kick off the school year. And they have pirate-themed stuff up in their rooms, in the hallways. And uh, there's a, 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 su a superintendent in Corpus Christi, Texas, for example, who got Teach Like a Pirate pendants for all the teachers to wear on their lanyards. And uh, this is something that a lot of administrators have bought into. Once they, um, once they see past some of the, the showy, flashy stuff, and they see that really what we're talking about is being passionate about changing kids' lives, being passionate about teaching, and uh, embracing creativity in the classroom and being fully immersed in our classrooms and all that. When they see what's actually behind the teacher like pirate system, they absolutely buy right in. And um, there's even been schools who have done things that are called uh, Teach Like a Pirate Days. And I've written about this on my blog uh, last, it, towards the end of last school year. And what this is, is they took my question from the transformation chapter. The question is, if they didn't have to be there, would you be teaching in an empty room? And they said, let's, let's try. Let's see what happens. And so, for example, a principal from Ohio named Ryan McLean set up the first Teach Like a Pirate Day. There was no schedule for the kids. Teachers submitted uh, pitches, like uh, like a conference pitch, like we, you put a proposal for a session when you give a, when you do a conference about what they were going to do, what kind of experience they were going to create for kids in their room that day. He compiled all of those into a program, and then kids showed up at school in the morning. And just like when we go to maybe a professional development conference, we get to choose sessions that we want to attend. Kids got to choose 
classes and experiences that they wanted to attend. And it was like, he said it was like Disneyland. The kids were racing across campus to get to the next class. And uh, it was a bar raising experience for teachers because they saw, hey, if I want, if I want kids to be in my room, I have to, I have to raise the bar a little bit. I have to come up with something that would be engaging enough for kids to come to, even if they didn't have to. And that's where we want to be because we work in this unbelievable profession. Check this out for um, a business model. Our customers have to come to our business. It's a law. They have to be there. And so we don't have to be amazing for our kids to show up. It's a law they have to be there. And so, but we don't want to slide on that. We want to be amazing anyway. We want to be the teachers that are something about us, something about how we make kids feel in class that they would want to be a part of our room anyway. And so um, I've had unbelievably positive reception from administrators to the Teach Like a Pirate system. A good vision for you to pitch, Barbara. Yeah. Somewhere. <laughs> Maybe I need to go to Corpus Christi. <laughs> Brave of them to try that because you never know what might happen. You know, it, I remember when I was in school, I knew what teachers I wanted to go to, what classes I wanted to be in because those teachers were more fun. Yeah. And then the ones that we didn't have much choice, those weren't very fun. Right. And so this this is all about being that teacher for the kids that, that, that would have the line outside the door. That's kind of what the Teach Like a Pirate philosophy is about is, hey, how can we be that teacher? That's who we want to be. Wonderful. Tamara has a question for you. Tamara, are you still here? Yes, I'm here. Can everybody hear me? I can hear you, Tamara. Perfect. Well, my question was, and I, I appreciated your response to um, my post, but have you seen, like, how would you propose getting and sharing the Teach Like a Pirate method with and enticing other teachers to look at it? You know, for example, I have a teacher that she sees kids as just spores, in her own little words. You hear all those negative comments behind her back. You know, she's one of those teachers that you're wondering why the hell she's in teaching. Right. And I think something like this, I mean, if she could see that she's not even a lifeguard, let alone a, a swimmer in the pool, how would right. you look about approaching nice like, hey, you need to read this? Just right. just t lay it out there the way it is, Paul. <laughs> um, well, I have had uh, some success or heard some success with, teachers putting the book into other teachers' hands um, and not sharing it as in, like, hey, you need to read this, but sharing it as in, hey, I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm excited about this. This has been, this has, like, really helped me, and, like, I'm trying to share it with as many people as possible kind of a attitude. And, uh, but all that being said, I also – think that there's um, there's some people, and this is probably not going to be a popular answer, there are some people that you're wasting your time with. And um, I think you offer them every single bit of a chance that you can. And it's that whole, like, you can bring the horse to water, but you can't force them to drink kind of a thing like that. And so you, you can show them where the water is. You can show them how great the water tastes. And you can model for them and be, you be the, you, you know, that expression, be the change. You be the change. You be the person that uh, you want them to be. And then at the same time, I know that there's some people that I'm just not going to reach. And I'm okay with that. And I'm not uh, beating myself up over that, nor am I going to get sucked down into the negativity of that. And that's part of that in the third chapter, third part of the book I mentioned that um, I don't, I don't, I don't argue with teachers. I don't engage. I'm, I don't get confrontational with them. Um, I don't. I've had a few, very few, but sometimes a teacher on Twitter here or there 
that want to really push back against me and try to kind of uh, go after me and want me to kind of to, to bait. They try to bait me into an argument or debate, and and they're very frustrated that that I don't take the bait and I I just kind of ignore them, and that almost sets them off even more. But I, what I'm trying to do is too important to my purpose and our purpose as educators, not just my purpose, but our, as teachers, our purpose is too mighty to be dragged down by the naysayers. We can't let the naysayers be a weight that pulls you down. You have to, some people, you're gonna, you have to cut the rope and leave them behind. And like I said, I know that might not be a popular answer, um, but don't cut the rope until you, you do, you've done everything you can, but then if it doesn't work, I, I am not going to get down and wrestle in the mud with uh, some of these people. I'm just I'm gonna I'm gonna move on and do my thing. Point. Um, there's a lot of research, and especially with technology and education, that says that our modeling is more important than anything we say, anything we argue. You know, it is what we do. Um, and so, you know, there are other people who are going to behave the way they behave. We can only um, focus on the way we behave and be the best teacher that we can be, the best us that we can be. And so, you know, people will get on our nerves and, uh, you know, we will not enjoy the way that they teach and it will probably make us upset if they're teaching our students because we wouldn't have done that. But on the other hand, um, Alienating this person will only uh, will only undermine, you know, any of your attempts to to do the modeling and just to show, you know. And I'm not saying do the modeling to show the person there's another way, but just do the modeling because people take a lot from what you live. And so uh, I think that is just a very very good point, and many many things outside of our control there. Right, and and I want to be sure that I got. I don't want to be misunderstood. I'm, um, I'm not talking about that you would become in any way confrontational with the person as you're leaving them. You know, I, I'm just saying, hey, you give them everything that you can. You be the change. You do what you should. And then if they're not with you, you keep moving on. You're not, you're not getting on them. Or I, I, I look at it like, uh, and I think I might even have said this in the book. Negativity is like kryptonite to our superpowers. And um, I am not going to be around kryptonite because I know what that does to my superpowers. So um, as soon as I find that something is kryptonite, then I'm staying away. Teach Like a Pirate um, book group or a Teach Like a Pirate theme for Halloween. Uh, you know, if you, if you need a way to just kind of say, hey, maybe we should read this book without Finding fault, that could be a nice little that could be a nice little hook. Yeah. Okay, um give, cho give give chocolate with it. Yes. <laughs> chocolate with the book. Chocolate Heather, coins. <laughs> Heather, would you like to ask your question? Question is what is um what's the biggest struggle you've had in teaching this way? Heather, who is that behind you? That's my little son North. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Did you know that your mom is talking to a pirate tonight? <laughs> yeah. Oh no, look, I am a pirate. <laughs> oh no, wait, so someone not. else is there now too. You're not a all right. So, well, <laughs> all right. So, tell me, uh, tell me your question again. Mm -hmm. Oh, I lost you. you. Had <laughs> Lee, did you hear the question? I can't. I can't hear her anymore. Yeah, Heather, can you re repeat the question? Um, I think it's. What has been the biggest struggle that you have had in teaching this way? That's the first question. The biggest struggle I've had in teaching this way. Um, I 
I think it probably would go back to the the question that was posed earlier, and just that this uh, to teach this way consistently takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of energy, and so and it's and it's a little bit addicting when you start doing it, and uh, once you see the success that's happening, you want to do more and more and more of it, and it can be. Um, it can be a, a siren song, and it, it can kind of draw you in. And the next thing you know, you could realize that you're spending uh, way too much time, and you're, you're not you're not having that downtime that we were talking about earlier. So I think the biggest struggle is the idea that hey, this you have to take care of yourself in order to teach this way, because you cannot teach this way um, on half a tank. You have to be have the full tank. You have to have a lot of energy, and uh, so just not to get too sucked in to what you're doing. Her other question was, what's your absolute favorite hook or lesson that you've ever done? Your absolute favorite. <laughs> okay, so this one, if you were to ask my students, uh, what is their favorite lesson? I'm almost sure that uh, a vast majority of them would probably tell you it's the lunar landing lesson. And the lunar landing lesson is when they walk into the room, um, I'm dressed up in sort of a NASA kind of an outfit, uh, and the entire room is covered in black. There is no light that's coming in the room, and there's just accent lights, enough for them to see as they walk in. Most of the desks have been cleared out, and they get on the floor with their, uh, their head on a backpack underneath their head. They're lying on the floor on their back. And the lesson, and there's Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon music playing as well. And it's a very creepy and eerie scene as they come in. And then I talk to them about the lunar landing. And there's a, a major uh, life-changing lesson or a series of life-changing lessons that are embedded inside of the lunar landing. And then at a certain part of the class, all light, there's a video that they're going to see partly tied to the music and what we're doing. But then at a certain point, that's going to go off, and all light is going to be removed from the room. So you can't even see your hand in front of your face. And there's a laser. I'm doing a, like a laser show on the ceiling, uh, sync to the Pink Floyd music. And when the, when the bell rings and the lights, you know, the accent lights go back on, they're going to feel like they have been transported to a different world. Like they're not going to want to – they try to come back for another period. Like they want to try to break into a later period and skip another class. I have to like watch the door and make sure people don't come in twice. So it has the content, it has life changing lessons, it has music, it has lasers, it has they're on their back. There, it's uh, I would I think that's probably the one that they would tell you is their absolute favorite lesson. Sounds like a lot of fun. But it also sounds like a whole lot of work too. It is a, a whole. It is a whole lot of work because every single bit of the room is covered, and every spot where light can get in has been has been taken care of. It's like walking into a yeah into a theme park. Yeah. Very much. Yeah. And that's like one of those questions from part two of the book: is if you were designing a, a theme park exhibit for this subject, what would you do? And that's one of the questions that led to this lunar landing lesson. Like, if you were going to have an experience for kids where they got to feel like they were in space and be a part of a lunar landing and to learn about all of this, but in the atmosphere, they would kind of feel, you know, sort of like you're just out there. What would that look like? Well, it wouldn't look like your classroom. You would want to control every single part of your environment so that you can build that experience for kids. Okay, so I have an off-script question, and that would be, have you ever engaged, like, one section of your students or a group of students in helping you to build these experiences for other students? Like, uh, do the kids yeah. help you uh, set up for the lunar landing or set up for some of these? Yeah, there are, there are times where kids, uh, where I'll put out when it is that I'm going to be, um, setting these things up, and some of them will come and help. I've also enlisted some to sort of be uh, 
the, the crew to help me. There's yeah. even been cases where um, I've actually even hired kids. Uh, like there was a case not too long ago where sometimes if I do a local seminar, I do the whole room that so looks like this darkened pirate cave. And I was going to be coming in town on a plane flight late one night and doing the seminar early the next morning, and it's an intensive setup. And so I hired a group of students to go to the facility where I was presenting and do my entire setup for me and uh, so that I could walk in the next morning, and it was just how it was supposed to be. In addition to that, a lot of uh, – some of my – some of my best ideas – have come because of something that a student said in a previous year or something that, an example of this is I do a mountain man lesson where there's a, some kind of creative and writing activities where they're taking mountain man slang and they're creating tall tales. And then we tell the tall tales around like this little fake campfire thing that I have in the center of the room. So the kids are um, working collaboratively collaboratively in groups and doing this creative writing by creating these tall tales. And the tall tales, of course, they have to understand the kind of things that mountain men actually did and went through in order to create their tall tales. So there's the content piece to it as well. Well, a kid was kind of joking around and was making fun of my campfire and said, mm-hmm. if you really, like, if this was really a, uh, if this was really a mountain man rendezvous, I'd have a marshmallow on a stick and we'd be having s'mores right now. And, <laughs> And let me just tell you that my head just about blew off my shoulders. And I thought to myself, this is the last year that I'm having a fake campfire. <laughs> we're doing this baby for real outside. And I'm, and we're having, we're having kids bring in marshmallows and chocolate and graham crackers. And so now, if you were to come to my mountain man's hall tale, there is, uh, we tell the tall tales at a real fire and we're having s'mores and we're having a good time. And it's just ramped up. What that is, is it's just trying to, it's like this idea of taking lessons from where they are and just saying, how could I ramp this up to the next level? How can I take this from just a lesson to an experience? So if you just come to class and you see a lecture about mountain men, that's a lesson. But if you come to class and you're around a campfire telling tall tales and eating s'mores, that's an experience that kids will never forget. So actually, yeah. that's what the back of the T-shirt says, by the way. The back of the T-shirt says, don't just teach a lesson, create an experience. And that's a big part of what this is all about. So that that opens up the question in my head here about, do you have guests that come in and help you with these? Okay, well, uh, there's... Uh, sort of a silly answer to this and then a more serious answer. The silly answer is I have guest speakers all year long and very quickly the kids realize that when I tell you there's going to be a guest speaker on Wednesday or a guest speaker on Friday, they know that 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 means that I'm coming in character. So I am the guest speaker and I have, you know, maybe 20 to 25 different characters that I am over the course of the year. So they have guest speakers all the time. They all just happen to be about six foot five, Um, even the women happen to be about six foot five. But uh, I, and then I will sometimes have guests come in too that are real guests who are experts in a certain area or maybe a part of a historical event or some teachers at my school have done, like they'll have Pearl Harbor survivors come in or you know, our world history classes have Holocaust survivors come in and speak to the kids and different things like that. So uh, there are sometimes real guests, but more often the guest is me. That's really cool, and that's very, very practical for a teacher on a budget. You know, who yes. <laughs> you can, you know, you can bring people in via Twitter, via social media, that sort of thing. Yes. But uh, there's nothing like having the real thing. Yes. So, yeah, uh, Sk- Skype is a great way to do it. Like, I'm, there's lots of authors that will Skype with classes, and people that will Skype with classes and and do it for for free. And I've offered this as well. For example, to uh, classes who or clubs that are into writing and want to like kids that want to put to publish books and I've done this before with like creative writing clubs and all that where I'll Skype with the class and the kids can just grill me about the process that I went 
to went through to write the book and how I got the book published and why I made the decisions I made and how I published it. And um, you know, so there's there's lots of people out there that will will come into your classroom um, for free or for very little expense through Skype and things like that. Well, we have five minutes left, and what I'd like to do at this point is just open it up because we started with these questions not having spoken today. And now we've heard a lot of his perspectives and uh, his convictions and his practices. And so I'm sure there, has, there must be some follow-up questions. So why don't we just open it up, and if you have a question, you can type it in. You can speak it, whatever you'd like to do. No questions? I have a question. Very good. When, when, when am I when am I going to uh, come to Alaska and and do do one of these conferences like the um, she was talking about earlier? Well, we we'd love for you to January two thousand fourteen. No, I better. Ask me. Well, I'm thinking that stream next summer might be. A, oh, I'm um, thinking Asti. Well, ASCII might work too, but that's technology. Come on. Oh, I mean, I can come do a session on Twitter and Twitter chats. Absolutely, yes. That's the biggest conference in uh, in Alaska, and the biggest teacher conference in Alaska oh, okay. is the Alaska Society for Education Technology, and it's in February. It's in Anchorage, and okay. yeah, we'd love to have you there. And we just happen to know the advice, uh, not the advice, the president. The, uh, the president of ASCII this year. I happen to know oh. him a little bit, so we just need to, there yeah. You go. I'm sure that for the price of a little uh, pirate t-shirt that, uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, my, uh, my honeymoon was in Alaska. Where in Alaska? I took uh, an inside passage cruise ah. for, that was, that was our honeymoon. Oh, very good. Yeah, it was awesome. Okay, so Deborah Taylor is asking a question on the uh, on the VAC channel. She says, "What's the best piece of advice you give to a new teacher?" The best piece of advice that I can give to a new teacher, um, I would say that one of the best pieces of advice is that you have to be comfortable in your own skin and you have to be yourself in the classroom. And as soon as you are trying to be somebody else and trying to be fake, or as soon as you are trying to do things, you know, a lot of times we try to emulate our master teachers or people who are, you have to have your unique voice that you add to your classroom if you're going to be the most effective. And uh, don't let anybody keep you from doing that. And sometimes, as ex sometimes experienced teachers uh, might might try to do that. And they think that um, you're the you're the newcomer, and so hey, you do things the way that they we've always done them, and that's that's the way it goes around here, and that's something that you have to have the um, the strength of character to to resist. Take what's take what's useful and reject what's not what's not. Absolutely. And then Jen wants to know what grade levels you've taught. Have you ever taught primary? So I've taught. Um, as a uh, formal teacher, all my, all my teaching is in the, at the high school level, but I have taught uh, as part of a ch the chess in schools program as a, in an elementary school. So I used to teach, come in to, to classrooms and teach chess to elementary school students. And then in addition to that, um, I have worked as a youth basketball coach um, in various formats with um, younger, you know, younger students for much of my life. Ever since I was in high school, actually, I've been working, teaching at camps and working in various um, youth sports kind of settings. Wonderful. And then um, Barbara, who actually uh, tonight did change a flight that she had so that she could come and be a part of this chat. Oh, uh, wow. Thank you. Yes, Barbara says, come to Point Hope, 
it's a teaching experience that you will never forget. And I have no doubt of that. I've never been to Point Hope, but it sounds like uh, a very delightful place and certainly a very different place. I'm going to have to get on Google Maps after this and check out what some of these places are. Yes, yes. And uh, it's uh, we, we're we from all over, but the one time a year we do get together is at ASCII. And so I am. I'm going to talk to Mark and we'll see what we can't do at ASCII this year because uh, that would be a blast. Okay. Uh, we ready to know who won? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Jennifer McCarty was the first one. Hey, Jennifer. Jennifer. Send Jennifer? Me your, it, she's right here. Met Alaska. Woot, woot. So, Jennifer, you need to decide whether you want me to ship you a signed, personalized book or whether you want to get a uh, Teach Like a Pirate t-shirt. And then um, somehow, either through Lee or by emailing me or whatever, I need to somehow get the shipping address and size and all that if you want to get it, if you want it to be a t-shirt. She wants a t-shirt and an eye patch. And she can just <laughs> send me just send me your address, Jen, and send me the size she wants. And I'll forward it on today. Who's the Perfect. other person, uh, Virgil? She's had to leave, so it looks like. But she was uh, the second one. Wait, well, you now is this isn't this one of those that have to be present to win? I think so. I think if it's the second one, then it must okay. be Andrea, right? Uh, then it would probably be. Let me let me see. Let me let me redo this. <laughs> Tamara no, no. says it's her. Yeah. Well, hold on. <laughs> it was. Uh, then that would be. Ann Curland would be the other one. Ann Curland. Yay, Ann. Ann, Send what do you me. want it to be? Signed book or a T-shirt? You all already have the book, so that's probably not a big pull. <laughs> I bet it's going to be a T-shirt. Oh, no, she does. Signed she book. wants the signed book. You got all it. All right, Ann. So, okay. Ann, send me your address, and I'll forward that on to Dave. That's awesome. That is awesome. <laughs> Do you sell fine coffee? Win, and I didn't to know. know. Uh, yeah. Tamara, are you going to be? <laughs> are you going to be? He says yes. Yeah. So uh, if you if you go to daveburgess dot com, and you there's a there's a link at the top, uh, a whole set of links, um, and one of the tabs is products. And in the products link, you can get a, a personalized signed book and the T-shirts and all that kind of stuff. Also, please feel free to join me on Twitter in the TLAP hashtag. Would love to have you join in. The, the chats are Monday nights, but you can put stuff in there anytime. And men, if you want to ask me a question, just at Burgess Dave. Um, I would love to have you follow me on Twitter. And it's a place where I spend a lot of time interacting with teachers. So that's a way that you can have easy access to me as well. The Teach Like a Pirate group is so much fun, and I just kind of get drawn into it every Monday. And just sort yeah. of, you know, and is there's, it Thursday too, or is it just uh, Monday? There's different, you know. There's all sorts of offshoots to it. Like there's a World Languages group, this WLT Lab. There's groups and book studies that are kind of popping up all the time. But the kind of the main home space is the T Lab hashtag. Uh, on Mondays, but um, yeah, it's a it's a really positive oh, group of nice. people that are very very welcoming to newcomers, and uh, I think that you love you love. So to the Teach Like a Pirate is hashtag TLAP, and to yep. follow Dave, it's at Burgess Dave, yep. and then the TLAP chat is Monday, and is it I think it's at five thirty Alaska. It's, um, it's it's six o'clock Pacific time, so that would be so it's five our five, time. Okay, yeah, yeah. And so, and he does sell the signed shirt, the signed book. And I'm glad to know that there's a Teach Like a Pirate hoodie there because I too am going to go and order one because we can't wear t-shirts up here anymore. And yeah. so, and you wanna, here's what it. Um, I'll show you what it. 
the hoodie. Oh, that's awesome. This is the front of the hoodie. And you see it's got its little, this is the... Yeah, little, little hood. Hood. And then the back, yeah. I'll show you what the back looks like. Um, so it's got the little pirate there. And it says, uh, don't just teach a lesson, create an experience. That's awesome. And uh, if if I could venture to hope that um, that this book and the work you're doing is the beginning of a uh, pendulum swing in an opposite direction, it is my absolute hope. And I tell you that when I read your book, I, for the first time as a teacher in, in a decade, felt a great deal of hope and a great deal of optimism. And I thought, Maybe, maybe, you know, the bean counters won't win this one. So right. uh, I just Listen. appreciate everything that you're doing, everything oh, thank that you're you. doing. I really enjoyed joining you tonight, and it's a movement that's spreading, and uh, we need as many crew members as possible, so happy to have all of you on board. Hi, we're on the crew. Right on. Call on us anytime. I want to be uh, the crew. I want to be the captain. Come on. Dave's the <laughs> captain. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, let you, yeah. I'll let you come up and steer the ship again, Paul. <laughs> All right. Well, everyone, thank you so much for joining us, Dave. Thank you so much my for sharing with us. And uh, and we're we're just all going to move on, I know, in the week with new eyes. So, uh, so excellent. I, Jennifer, I, don't forget to email me your address, Jen and, uh, and Ann, and I'll get it on to Dave. And we'll see you all in the Twitter sphere and in the blogosphere. All so, mine have to go back to class now. Oh, oh, <laughs> except for the people who have to uh, have to go to statistics. Have fun in statistics. Our camera, no mutiny allowed. Just make uh, make Virgil walk the plank, or make him show you where the uh, treasure is. I'm sure, there's some statistics treasure out there somewhere. Bye, Tamara. It's great for you to be here. Gary, thanks so much for coming. Thank you all for coming. Dave, this was just wonderful. And uh, I think no technological problems or anything. And they enjoyed it a very great deal. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you, Dave. Yep. You are welcome. My pleasure. I had a fun time. Oh, uh, good. And yes, I'll email you the information about Ashley. The call from presenters hasn't come out yet, but if I know more, he'll be on the phone with you next week. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and uh, send along those addresses, and I'll drop that stuff in the mail tomorrow. Very good. I'll do it. Yep. All right. Bye-bye. Well, have, have a great evening. Okay, you too. Okay. Bye-bye.